Hi, this is Eric Postowski. Welcome to another segment of EP on EP. It's a delight to have with me today a, a person I've known for many years and who's done such great work in the field of electrophysiology, Dr. Shiv Kumar, who's Professor of Medicine at UCLA. Shiv, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Eric. It's an honor to be here. Now, I know this is going to surprise you, but I'm going to ask you to talk about the autonomic nervous system in VT. Wow, I almost <laughs> guessed that. A total, a total <laughs> surprise, huh? So let's start with basics. Um, when I first started in electrophysiology, it, you know, it was really not known how much auto autonomic innervation it was to the ventricle. You, why don't you start the audience with what is the importance of the sympathetic and parasympathetic in the ventricle that might pertain to what we're going to talk next? It's a great question, Eric. Uh, when you look at how the nervous system controls the heart, in fact, it controls every cell in the human body, as you know. We call it the internet of the human body. But the heart, for all mammals, it is life or death, how the nerves control it. And the nerves are needed so that the heart can talk to the lungs and there is proper circulation of blood. And most importantly, the nervous system exists to make sure that at a moment of extreme physiologic stress, fight or flight, as we've heard in medical schools, that response is only possible because of innovation of the heart, so that you'll be able to instantly increase your cardiac output and be able to get up and run if you heard a fire alarm, or in my part of the country, if you felt an earthquake. <laughs> so right. that's uh, perhaps, an, and that is a survival reflex, and that, of course, profoundly gets altered with disease. In fact, 90% of all heart disease is because of neural signals from the heart to the brain, which has obviously opened up a huge area of science, which is going to help millions of people. And in our own field in electrophysiology, it's had a very powerful impact on understanding ventricular arrhythmias. So let's, let's go to that because you've done such innovative and important work in this area by um, playing around with, uh, with uh, what was put into our hearts, right? Uh, your autonomic nervous system uh, alterations to help VT. Tell us a little bit about how you do that and also uh, unilateral versus bilateral and most importantly, who are the best candidates? A great point. You know, my own inspiration for having done this actually comes from a remarkable study that was published in 1961 at the university where you trained, which is Duke University. And uh, at that time, uh, uh, Estes and Islaur published a very interesting paper of patient uh, who was having incessant VT in whom they did bilateral sympathectomy. Until then, of course, sympathectomy was being done in the pre-angiography era for angina. And yeah, I remember that actually. Yes, yeah. and, and it's, it's interesting. And, and Duke University's great contribution to medicine. Subsequently, Art Moss and Doug Zipes also published that. And the Europeans started using that, as you know, they did left-sided sympathectomy for uh, channelopathies. Right. And in our own experience in the early 2000s, when we vastly expanded our catheter ablation program for ventricular tachycardia, it became obvious to me attending your courses in the 90s, and I still remember uh, the interesting observations that come up that uh, Things like you know sedating a patient and control ventricular tachycardia that shows we see this all the time, and we essentially took two parts of what was known and put it together. So we did the most complex VT ablations, epicardial, endocardial, and a patient was still in VT storm. Hmm. So out of sheer desperation, we started putting in thoracic epidural catheters. Oh really? And that was life saving, and subsequently we decided we should do surgical sympathectomies, which is how the field was born. The second part of your question, unilateral versus bilateral, for structural heart disease, you always have to do bilateral, bilateral. sympathectomy. So can I stop you just to say, um, why in a sense? Because um, at least a lot of the anatomy suggests there's preferential input to, to different parts of the heart. I, am I wrong on that? Is there, is there not preferential input? It's a good point. I think uh, with increasing knowledge, we have learned in the past two decades that sympathetic input to the heart is almost uniform. It has layers of sympathetic input. Parasympathetic input, you know, for different regions, especially the SA node and AV node is very den densely innervated. Right. So the left-right differences really is mainly because of the area of the ventricle. Okay. So left, uh, L L left sympathetic uh, denervation was used because the LSG controls most of the left ventricle. 
And for patients with channelopathy, that provides an excellent outcome. Okay. So even for structural heart disease, we always start with the left side. But the international collaborative study that we did actually showed bilateral. that bilateral. Yeah, was I read that paper. Yeah, so that's why you do bilateral. Absolutely, and the NIH and our tax dollars at work has now funded the pilot phase of the Prevent VT trial, and we are hoping that this is a trial that UCLA, Vanderbilt, and um, Johns Hopkins are doing. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Desegi, is a PI for that study, and we are hoping that that pilot study will set the stage for a definitive trial. Okay, so the big question, we all take patients to the lab for VT ablations, not me personally much anymore, but um, so you have a patient who has routine, you know, uh, coronary disease, VT, and you're gonna take them for ablation. I'm, I'm guessing you don't automatically, I should, that's a bad word, right? Automatically take care of the autonomic nervous system. There must be some, some uh, kind of uh, a logic flow for you when you do that versus everything else. Can you help us out on that? Sure, it's a, it's a great question, Eric. We currently use uh, neuromodulation in two settings. One is when a patient is dying of VT storm, to stabilize them so that we can get them to the cath lab. Oh, to do a routine ablation. Uh, yeah, okay. and we always, always, if there's a substrate that can be ab ab addressed, you have to address the substrate. And of course, it bookends on the other side. If nothing else can be done with catheter ablation, do you don't that. want to transplant a, a perfectly good heart, which could work for the next 10 years. And that's where sympathectomy has a huge role. It could also have a huge impact in something that you and other leaders have talked about for years. And that is, what do you do for patients who don't qualify for an ICD? Right. Who the EFs are, is above 35 and they simply, it's hard to show cost that's very effectiveness. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's uh, where, that's where, you know, it, how do we address, we are the heart rhythm society. 22 people die every minute suddenly in this world. It's too high a cost to pay. That's a very interesting observation that someone's gonna have to do the study, of course. But so, getting back to that before we, we wrap up, why does it work? And what I mean by that isn't just some philosophical thing. I like to think of a substrate and triggers. I know it's simplistic, but that's how I like to think about it. So if you have a coronary disease and you have circuits in there that you're gonna go ablate, why should doing a denervation suddenly stop tachycardia? It's a great question. And the simple answer to that is, the signals going from the heart to the brain dramatically amplifies the amount of norepinephrine that's released in the heart. And in fact, we now think when you do S1, S2 stimulation in the heart, the reason why that is induces arrhythmias is if you have a substrate, you get the monomorphic tachycardia. Yeah. Sometimes you get polymorphic VTVF. We called it non-specific, but it's not non-specific. It's a lot of norepinephrine released in the heart, oh. and that is because of pacing. Because the heart, when it contracts differently, it causes sympatho excitation, which is why you get pacing-induced dyssynchrony heart failure, and ultimately, you know, this connection, Takosubo, you wherever you see you now see a new angle for how the nerves interact with the organ. So, from what I'm guessing is, uh, you're gonna say the brain's the trigger? Is that what you're gonna tell me? They, they, they play hand in hand. <laughs> your brain can activate your sympathetic nervous system. Right. You hear a fire alarm, a yeah. noise, but a scar in your heart, or if the heart contracts in a funny way, that can also trigger the yeah. process. No, which is why patients with tachycardia sometimes have anxiety. So. Where's your next move? Where are you? You've already given us a preliminary view into the study, but where, just in a short kind of a moment, where, where's the next step? Where, where do you want to take this? Uh, thank you for asking that question, Eric. And I'm hoping that all the trainees and the next generation of people who are listening to us, I can, with no doubts in my mind, state that this is a great area to investigate because I think we are going to become the neurobiologists of the heart. And electrophysiology is the field that brings science to mechanisms. And people may wonder, we are going to be using things like Botox in the neurons of the heart to control AFib. So the end of electrophysiology should be is uh, going away from pacemakers, away from defibrillators, and away from catheter ablation, but go into biological modulation. But we are still going to be the thinkers that right. all of us are. And you know, and it's a special joy to sit down with a great teacher like you, Eric. Oh, you're so To kind. ask these questions. Well, well the, the nice thing about your research, in addition to all the good it's done, is that you've done what I, I like to think 
clinical investigators should do. You've, you've based your research on the fundamental knowledge of physiology, and then you've taken it to the next step of how, how you can manipulate pathophysiology for, for the good of the patient. And you should be congratulated for it. It's a delight to have you here, Shiv. No, thank you so much, Eric. I'd probably you know, be right back at you and tell you that it's, it's people like you, teachers, who inspire us. And as we often quote at UCLA, the star of the team is the team. And the, the untrammeled joy of working in America is that the future is very bright. I think US is going to help lots and lots of people. And much like you, I'm looking forward to Shepping Nakas, seeing all the trainees. Shepping Nakas, listen to this. <laughs> Shep, thank you so much thank for joining us. Thank you so much, us. Eric.